someone say hello and ask how they're doing and um, we like to also welcome everybody joining us online this morning we're so happy that you are decided to worship with us this morning and uh, we'd love to see you here one day if you're in town in Middletown New York we are Cornerstone Church and we would love to worship with you in person as a family all right we are going to continue in our worship and just raise our voices to God Put aside all those thoughts that are just distracting you from the thoughts of God this morning. John 4, 24, Christ tells us that the time has come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father's looking for those who will worship him in that way, for God is spirit. So who, those who worship him must also do in spirit and in truth. This means that we need to honor God, not just on the external, on the outside, but also internally with sincere, sincere honor and glory to him. Let's sing these next song together. He is Christ our Lord, the light of the world.
to you this morning with that words we just said in our hearts and hopefully God in our in our thoughts this morning that you are all together lovely and worthy God I, we were just I was just talking before service started and we talked about you mentioned God that there's certain things in our life that we have control over and God we are we have control of the controllable things in our life but there are many many things that we go through where we have no earthly control of the circumstances that we find ourselves in but God, you are always in control. And as followers of Christ and those that we have believed and trust and know who Jesus is, God, you've also given us that Holy Spirit to help us in those times, to, to give us those answers when we need answers, God, to give us comfort when we need to feel comfort. And we, God, we call upon the Holy Spirit, God, to fill this place this morning as we are singing songs of worship and praise to you, as we pray to you, as we read your word this morning, making it real into our lives, God, we pray for the Holy Spirit to come and to indwell our hearts and indwell this place at this time. As we continue to worship you this morning, bless this time that we have. And there's nothing worth more. I will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. As I've tasted and seen. The sweetest of love when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence is full. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence. more I will never come close no thing can compare you're our living home and your presence Lord as I've tasted and seen the sweetest of love when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone and your presence is full Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be over. 
To be overcome by your presence, Lord. God, thank you for the gift of that Holy Spirit to come and, and God, I pray for us to really glorify you this morning. Help us to learn something from your word this morning. God, thank you for this time. In your name we pray. Amen. We don't go to church. We are the church. You have been filled with the very same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. You have overcoming power from heaven living inside of you. Who are we? Outside. What happened yesterday? Yeah, we uh, listen. We we've had a very calm winter, yeah, right? Everybody agrees we've had a very good winter. But every time that we have something really kind of important happening at church, it always seems to happen. And and um, I, first, I want to start off. We're, we're in a series called "We Are the Church," okay? And um, today we're actually talking about something. I'm calling call, titling today. Uh, we do life together, um, and we exemplified that yesterday. Um, for those of you who are able to be here and watch this online, or, or some of you came and actually volunteered your time, we had a, a, a celebration memorial service for Fred Hammer, who's been a long time uh, member here at Cornerstone and um, has been a friend to, to many of us and um, just, just a great guy. Uh, Fred um, had passed away uh, and um, his family asked to hold the service here. And a very short notice, uh, I wasn't actually able to meet with the family um, and go over details until this past Thursday. And, um, and we had the, sad, the service on sa yesterday, Saturday. And uh, we had a lot of things to, to get done. We had a lot of things um, that had to be planned out. And I so appreciate, by my heart, all, the, all of you who are able to, to come in and support and to pitch in and we tear down this room and tear it back up again and, and provide, get the food, get it all ready. All that stuff was so... When you are able to, to work as a church and, and support each other, I'm talking about family, it actually it, it lessens the burden of the work as well. Many hands, right? Someone mentioned many hands make light work, and that's exactly what happened yesterday, and I really appreciate it. Um, and and uh, that's exactly what we're talking about in the series. That is what a church does. We've been talking about what is a church. A couple weeks ago, I asked the question, what's your first memory of the church? And I'll, I'll ask that question again. Think about it. You know, again, some of you, like me, kind of grew up in a church, and we have no memories outside of church. I was always in church. One time, I literally, when I was born, 
Uh, when Seth and I were born, my parents lived in a parsonage, an apartment above, at the church. Like, I was, lived at the church when I was first born. And I always felt, even though we didn't have a house or apartment in the church, I always felt like we lived in the church. So my first memory is that I don't have a memory outside of church. But, but some of you have different experiences. Some of you did not grow up in the church. Some of you very recently maybe started to attend here uh, or attend church in general. And that's, that's fantastic. But think about your first memory uh, of church. Some of us might have been maybe a Christmas and Easter type of service and people, which is, which is a great place to start. A reminder, church happens all the other 50 weeks of the year as well. But those are, those are fantastic times to come and to worship and to recognize who Christ is. But think about what is your first memory of the church. And here's the problem. We talked about this in week one. What people see looking from the outside of a church is often pale to comparison to what you read in the Bible. We talked about hypocrisy. We talked about uh, if you ask any person on the street, you know, we did a survey of, of folks and, and tried to figure out what their perception of, of church and by, and by the nature, what their perception of Christians are, you're going to have a, a vast array uh, of opinions. You're going to have some that might be believers and had good experiences with the church, and they'll say, well, the church stands for good things, and the church is here to help out, which are hopefully true things. But equally, you'll have probably more people, especially in this day and age, will say things like, well, Christians and churches, it's all a bunch of hypocrisy. It's all about the money. It's all about trying to fill the pockets of those who work in the church and are part of the church. Um, it's, it's not really centered towards people. And unfortunately, many people's perceptions and when looking from the outside is often paled in comparison to what we read in the Bible. In the first week, we talked about the mindsets of what a good uh, scripturally based church should be. We should be intensely devoted as a church, devoted to support each other, devoted to have the gospel spread across our community. That needs to be an intensely devote, devoted cause. We need to be focused on that. We also need to be a very generous church. And it's not just talking about you know, financial generosity. is included in that. But giving of yourselves in many other ways, your talents, your abilities, giving up of your time, supporting each other. And we need also need to be unapologetically share the love of Jesus and the gospel of Jesus Christ and make, and make no apologies for it. The truth of the scripture, the truth of the gospel is as relevant now as it was 2,000 years ago. And we as a church are going to share that gospel and share who Jesus was with everybody around us. And last week, we talked about the types of people that you find in a church. And I, and I asked you to kind of identify which one, one of these three types you may be. So types of people you find in the church, you're going to always find someone in need. I'm not talking about someone that comes and is begging for stuff. I'm talking about someone you come and you have a need in your life. Maybe it's, it's a spiritual need. Maybe there's some struggles. Maybe it's an emotional. Maybe it's a physical. Maybe it's a financial need. But you'll always find someone in need, and that might be you. You might be coming and saying, I have some needs in my life. I have some things, answers that to questions that I have in my heart. I have certain callings in my life or I have certain problems in my life, but there's a need to have that fulfilled. And church is for those who are in need. You also will find a type of person who just cares, who just cares and has empathy for people and gives of themselves and gives, again, of their time and their abilities and emotionally just try to connect with people and just have a shoulder to lean on or, or an ear to listen. So you'll find someone that cares. But at the same time, you'll also find people who are just preoccupied and preoccupied with everything in their life and they're so distracted sometimes but they're, in the, they're, they're missing the bigger picture of why we are here and what we are supposed to do. And we can all help someone in need if we all become someone who cares. So this week, I want to, uh, we're talking about we are the family. And, and I want to talk about a vision that any good church, and especially our church here, should have. And I want, to, I want you to imagine this for a second. And it's not, a, not, not terribly hard to imagine what I'm about to ask you because you all exemplify it, in my opinion, and the way that you serve each other, the way that we have come together as a family. But, but picture this and imagine this. Imagine when service is over, that we don't just rush out the door, that we actually spend time talking with each other, catching up with each other, hugging each other, asking each other how we're doing. Imagine that. Imagine, um, imagine that as a family... Um, when, we, when we're experiencing a difficult time in our life, a loss of a loved one, loss of a friend, and when the tears stop flowing, we are still hugging each other. We're still caring about each other. It's not a hard thing to imagine for us here because I really do feel that we have a great connection and empathy with each other. But that is 
ultimately the goal. The New Testament talks about the, the church as being a body of believers. And we all have different roles and responsibilities. And we talk about that. I mention that quite often. And I stress it because it's a vital thing for all of us to continue to remember that you have a part here. This is a scriptural teaching that we are the body of Christ. And we need to stick together. If one of us, you know, says, you know, I no longer want to be part of the body. I want to do my own thing. You're not going to get very far for very long. And if you leave and if you're not doing kind of your part as part of the body, that, that part is going to be missing. And it might not even be noticeable at first. But as time goes on, we're going to notice and, and, and note that something is gone and something is missing. We are meant to do things together. We're not meant to operate in silos by ourselves. There's a recent Harvard University study. Harvard, yes. Harvard, by the way, started, you know Harvard started as a, a theological school, a Bible college, just so everybody remembers. Um, Harvard, um, I went to school in Boston. I didn't go to Harvard. I'm not that fancy. But I visited Harvard many times. They have an open campus. You can actually just walk on and hang out, um, we, which we did. Um, but anyways, when you, uh, the, the main gates at Harvard University, there's these, these brick uh, um, gates, and they're open. But if you remove the brush, it's actually overgrown. But if you remove the brush, there's a plaque there that shows its dedication. And when it was, when it was started, it was started as an institute that, that trained young men at the time in God's word. It was a Bible college, right? Harvard is a little more than a little different than that now. But according to a recent Harvard University study, one in three people believe um, that you have needs, uh, I'll just read it this way, that you have needs in your life and no one to meet them. One in three people feel that there are some things in their life, there are needs in their life, and that there's no one in their life that can meet that need. Other people believe that there are hurts to share, that they, that, but they feel that there's no one that would be able to listen to them. And they also believe that they have love to give, but they have no one to receive it. That's one in three people believe that, and what that really is is they, they believe they have no one they can connect with, they have no one they can share their experiences, their good times and the bad times with. One in three people really believe that. And if, you're a nor if we're a normal group of, of three people, so if we just kind of divide ourselves into three people each this morning, that would represent roughly 36% uh, of us that would believe that we are in isolation. We have nobody to connect to. We have no outlet to, to express our love. We have no one to talk about our needs to. And do I think that we as a church, that, that necessarily represents us in percentage? I don't believe so. Again, I started this morning talking about how we are connected as a family. But that shows you what people that you meet on the street or people that you're talking to, the things that they go through in their life. And there's this feeling of isolation, this feeling that they are doing life on their own. We were not, we were not equipped, nor were, were we uh, actually supposed to do this life alone. We are to do this life together. Enduring ongoing feelings of loneliness, isolation, a longing to love and be loved. God never intended for it to be this way. I'm going to go back to the very first chapter, the very first verse of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1.1. 1, 1. It says this, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. You know the story. Most of us start reading the Bible. We might start in Genesis. Good place to start. We're in the beginning, right? He says, let there be light, and then he says the light was good. He created day and night. He created land and water, and he said it was good. He created the stars, the plants, the fish, the birds, and he said all this is good. Then God said there's something that wasn't good. And he created man without, with no one to celebrate with, to cry with, to laugh with, to share their life with. This is Genesis chapter 2 now, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man. He had created Adam at this point. He had created man. And he says, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper who is just right for him. And continuing in verse 22 and 23. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. Verse 23, at last, the man exclaimed, at last I have a partner. At last I have someone to do this life together with. Think about to what God said before he made man. Think about this. A few uh, in the chapter before this, back to chapter 1, verse 26, God actually says this. He says, then God said, let us, notice the, ten, the use of the word, let us make mankind in our image. 
in our likeness. Notice God said, let us make man in our image, a plural use of those words. It's hard to get around, to, to get our mind around who God is in the, in the triune God that we have. But God himself is never alone. God is a perfect community of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit that we just sang about just a few moments ago. Three distinct personalities united as one God. So why did God create man? If, if God was a, as a triune God, right? why did God create man? God didn't create us because he was lonely. God didn't create us because he was lonely and, and he had to create man and then woman to fulfill that need. That's not why God created us. God created us because and out of his love. Love isn't just what God does. It isn't just what he does. It's what he, who he is. Remember, the greatest commandment is what? To love your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And love your neighbors as yourself. And God is love, and that is why he created man out of his love. See, the early church... And we've been using the early church the last few weeks, and we always use the early church in most cases as a model because the early church had it right in many ways. And they also had it wrong. If you read into Paul's letter, sometimes his letter would, would, letters to the churches would, would praise the church for the way they handle some conflict or the way they're handling uh, issues around them. And equally, Paul would also write the churches and say, you've got to stop doing this. You, the, you, as a church, you've got to stop living your life like this, or you've got to stop you know, um, segregating things like in this way. But there's some good examples of the early church that really um, embraced the idea that they weren't supposed to do things in isolation. They were doing life together. We're going to be in the book of Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 46 and 47. It says this, Every day, not just Sundays, I want to just clarify that as we get started. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. People, Not just one day a week. Every day they continued to meet together. This is more than the physical proximity of just being around each other. There is emotional unity. They were part of each other's lives. Now, I'm not saying that we have to meet here every single Sunday. That's not exactly at all what I'm saying. Excuse me, every single day. Would I like to? I got to be honest, I would love to start my day every day with all of you. It would be a great way to start. We are, I'm not endorsing that or saying we have to do that now. But we can stay connected with each other more than just on Sunday mornings. In fact, many of us do. And, and if you don't, if, if the only time that you have connection with the other people in this church is on Sunday mornings, I encourage you to get involved in the other things that we offer as a church, other opportunities you have to get to know each other. The easiest one is prayer. You don't have to be physically with each other to pray for each other. We use the prayer app, the Echo Prayer app, and it's a great, it's a great tool that we're able to use to share our prayer requests and to lift up our requests to each other uh, and to celebrate when uh, that, if the prayer has been answered, but also we can also mourn together when, uh, when things happen as well. And we can share those experiences through the prayer app. That is a way for you to connect emotionally, if not physically, at least emotionally with each other. It's a way that we can continue to share in this life together. There's other opportunities. We have ladies' events that we offer here that we get together and, and worship together and, and have some, some fun and some food together. You know, great opportunity to get to know each other at a different level, more than just Sunday morning. They're able to connect a different level. We have a men's Bible study happening tomorrow night here at the church where, man, we get together and we read God's Word together, we study God's Word together, and it allows us to grow in our faith together and also allows us to get to know each other, share our heartaches and share our joy. Those are all things, and you continue to do things as, as a church family. We have family nights of the church. We get together, and we go bowling or have a game night like we have coming up very shortly here. Those things are meant for us to be more unified together, to have an emotional connection with each other, but also to have some fun, which builds emotional connection. We are meant to do this life together. The early church understood this, and every day they continued to meet together, and they broke bread in their homes. There's a fancy word for they ate together. They ate together and they fellowshiped. In other words, they talked and they connected and they grew together. Why did they gather so often? Very simply, they needed each other. Sound familiar? 
The early church faced persecution. They faced a lot of difficulties, some difficulties that we don't necessarily face in the same ways today. The persecution they endured that still happens to believers across this world. And though we might not have our doors locked here in, 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 in the States, uh, we might not be facing that level of persecution yet, but there are churches and believers across this world that still face persecution. We've got to remember that. We've got to pray for those folks, and we have to keep in our mind that the blessing that we have in this country to be able to worship together in the way that we do. The early church faced all types of persecution. They needed each other. They were able to pray for each other's needs. The early church was also able to share the miracles they were experiencing in the church. And at the same time, they are able to rejoice and also able to cry together. They were able to have glad and sincere hearts for what God was doing for them. But at times when the mourning happened, they are also able to mourn together. See, there's a fundamental difference between the first century church and churches today. The first century church believers desperately needed each other, and they knew it. They knew, as the first century church, essentially the first church, they knew that with the persecution and just the learning they had to do, they knew they needed each other. They knew that's why they were at each other's homes every single day. They were experiencing life together because they were sharing life together, and they were, and they were comforting, and they were emotionally connected, and they were just growing in their faith together. And the first century believers desperately needed each other. And at the same time, again, they knew they needed each other. They knew they had to be in physical space with each other. But here's the difference. Believers today, they desperately need each other. We desperately need each other. You were not designed to do this life on your own. You were not designed to, to, to just live in isolation and never connect with other people. And you might be saying, well, I'm not a really people person. I like to have my space. That's fine. I'm not talking about those who like movie nights on their own. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in general, emotionally, we need to have the support of other believers in our lives because you are not designed to do it together. So believers today desperately need that connection. They desperately need each other. But a lot of them have forgotten that. A lot of them have gotten comfortable with doing things on their own. Mental health experts in across this country and across this world say most people today are seeking autonomy and independence. They want to be able to say, I, I'm self-made. I don't need anybody else in my life. I can do anything on my own as long as I put my mind to it. They like to maybe observe things on social media, but really have no real interaction with people in real life. They like to work without the hassle of relationships, flexible schedules, limited activities. We've, sh we've shifted so many things to online. You can shop online. You can bake on bank online. You can watch messages, sermons online like we're speaking right now. A lot of people can work remotely. And if you really work it out in your life and you got the right job and those resources around you, in other words, Instacart actually comes to your house, right? You can and perceivably never have human contact with anybody if you choose to do that. You can do everything independently. You can work online. You could have your groceries delivered. You don't even answer the door. You just tell them to leave it at the door, and as soon as they leave, you can take them in. You can, in theory, but not really in theory, in reality, you can be completely separated from any other living person in your life. And unfortunately, a lot of people like that concept. They like the idea. They got comfortable with the idea of being an autonomous and just doing things independently. Am I saying that you shouldn't shop online? I got Amazon coming today. I'm telling you that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> Am I telling you that I don't, we don't bank online? Of course we bank online. Who doesn't? It actually is designed. I'm not saying we don't do those things. I'm not saying you shouldn't do those things. What I'm saying is you've got to have an ability and opportunities to emotionally connect with each other. And believers, the early church recognized this, and they did it in a very certain, very specific way. And we need to continue to do that together. We are not meant to do this life on our own. See, people are intentionally pursuing a life that destroys their mental health and robs them of real joy and lasting fulfillment. When we went to lockdown back in early 2020, March of 2020, um, I mean, we, pretty much everybody here was impacted by some sort of lockdown. Whether, whether you were not able to go to your job, um, and some, some of us had to work remotely. Uh, if you're a teacher in school or a student in schools, you went right, right to virtual. Everything was done virtually. And, and 
I, I get it in the, original, in the initial reaction to it, but they've already determined that some of the more long-term effects that isolation has had on people. It's changed our society across this world. It's changed our whole culture across this world. It's, it's, it's actually, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of the mental health impact for our kids that I've had to endure being in isolation and learning in isolation and not having people around them. I, I'm, I'm a little worried about the mental health of our, of our future generation. But people nowadays sometimes are intentionally pursuing a life without even realizing it that destroys that mental health and robs them of real joy and lasting fulfillment. Again, God never intended it for, to be that way. So what do we do as a church? How do we emotionally connect, spiritually grow? How do we love each other? When the service is over, we stay in the room, we hang out, and we talk, and we catch up. When the tears stop flowing, we continue to hug. What does that mean? It means that we recognize things in our life, and we are constantly trying to support and encourage each other. We do life together. We are a family of believers here. When we gather to do this life together, we laugh, hopefully a lot. We cry, absolutely. We celebrate, yes we do. Do we mourn, absolutely. But we do it all together. Three things, three things that happen when we gather together. And I just kind of want to point these out to, to help you kind of picture them in your mind. The first thing is this. When we gather together, it's a gathering of grace. What does that mean, a gathering of grace? Um, in the book of Philippians uh, 1, chapter, uh, verse 7, says, You have a permanent place in my heart. You have remained, this is Paul writing, by the way, you have a permanent place in my heart. You have remained partners with me in the wonderful grace of God. So because of God's grace, there's a feeling of, of belonging. There's a feeling of believing and becoming what God wants us to become. And so with grace, you are welcome with your question. Many of you, even as believers, you come into a church and you're going through some difficulties in your life. And you have questions around why God is doing certain things, why similar things are happening in your life. They're not necessarily the way that you wanted them or expected them to be. We've all had them, and some of you have had them in very drastic ways. Life has changed drastically for you. You are welcome with your questions. You are welcome with your doubts. You are welcome with your hurts, with your addictions, with your baggage, with your depression, with your anxiety. You are welcome to this place. You're welcome to this family with all of those things. Because we are a gathering of grace. What is grace? And there's many different definitions that I'm throwing up here right now for you. Grace is this. Grace is unmerited favor of God towards man. Unmerited favor. So you notice I also threw the definition of unmerited because some of you say, I don't really know what that word means. So I also looked this up as well. Unmerited. Something that happens that is not caused by human effort. In other words, something that you can't do on your own something that you can't earn on your own. That's what grace from God really is. It's unmerited favor of God towards man. That's why we say things like we are saved by grace. And it's in that grace that we find that solace, that we find peace. It's in that grace that we find ultimately our purpose for this life. It's in that grace that we find companionship with each other. We partner with grace. We are a gathering of grace. We forgive each other. We show grace. We have hurts in our lives. And we come and we confess. And we talk to each other about those things. And God fills us with his grace. You have sinned and struggles in your life. And you go to God and God shows you his grace every time. So we are a gathering of grace. There's no one exempt from that grace this morning. You might even say, you don't know the stuff I have in my life. You don't know the baggage that I'm carrying with me. You don't know the addictions that I'm going through. You don't know my past. You don't know what I've done. I don't know everything you've done. But you know God's grace. And we are a gathering of grace. You might sometimes, you ever invite someone to church? Hope you do. But you ever invite someone to church and the person says, you know what? 
I can't go, you don't know my past, I will not be welcomed in your church. I've had those conversations with people. I will not be welcomed in your church. And I said, you might not be welcomed in some churches, but you're more than welcome in my church. Because we're a gathering of grace. And that never, maybe didn't say it that way. We're a gathering of grace. But I say, you know what? We are a bunch of, 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 of broken people, imperfect people that serve a perfect God. And whatever, whatever baggage you have in your life, I got the same baggage. You might have different stuff in the suitcase, but I still got a suitcase full of it. But I understand grace. We are found people that find people. We are no perfect people allowed. We are a gathering of grace. So we partner in that grace. Second thing we are, we are a gathering of healing. We gather together to heal. We confess to God. For, healing works like this. We con confess to God for forgiveness. And then we also confess to people for healing. It's a scriptural thing. And James chapter 5, verse 16 says this, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so you may be healed. You come and you confess and you pray. Healing happens together. Spiritual healing, emotional healing. The church is not a place for the perfect people. The church is a hospital for our souls. It's where broken people, hurt people come and experience the grace and the healing that comes from God. The hardships that you have gone through, the ones that you've gone through in your past uniquely qualify you then to help someone else. And that's, a, that's the thing. one thing about the hardships and the difficult times that you go through, the heartaches you go through. It makes you also uniquely qualified to help someone else who might be going through that same type of hardship, that same type of struggle. You're uniquely qualified because of the healing that God has done in you that you can now in turn help heal others. The hardships that you're going through right now will prepare you again to help others in the future. So we are a gathering of healing. So we're a gathering of grace, we're a gathering of healing, and then we're a gathering of mission. There's a purpose for our gathering. Acts chapter 2 again, verses 46 and 47. Again, the same verse I read before. Every day they continue to be together. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They praised God, and the Lord added the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We are a gathering of mission. I asked all these verses to put up here. These are just quick references. A number of verses in the New Testament. Serve one another. Galatians 5.13. Notice kind of the theme that I'm reading here. Serve one another. Show hospitality to one another. Be kind to one another. Encourage one another. Carry one another's burdens. You already know the pattern there. This is not, it doesn't say serve by yourself. Show hospitality to just yourself. Be kind to yourself. Because that's what the world tells you, by the way. That's a mindset of the world nowadays. Autonomy. You don't need anything else. You can do this life on your own. The complete opposite to what God's word tells us. Encourage one another, not just yourself. Carry, not just your burdens. We carry each other's burdens. There's autonomy in the local church. And there's a family within this church. Normally, here's what I do. And I ask, what can we do together? Think about what's possible. Think about what we can do to, to meet each other's needs, to meet our community's needs. And I'm going to throw some ideas around here and some things that we already do. We have some great community outreaches for families. And we, start with, we, and we have a lot of stuff directed towards kids. And I've had people tell me, you know, we do a lot of stuff for kids. You know why we do stuff for kids? Because kids usually come with a parent or caregiver, right? Kids don't usually come by themselves, right? So there's a reason. And, and also families will do things, will do things for their kids to entertain their kids and provide safe environment for the kids. So we do have a lot of events for our kids. Uh, here, a little commercial for you. We have our extravaganza coming up at Easter on April the 8th. April, yes, the 8th is when we're doing this. And uh, we have a ton of eggs in the back, and Bill's going to talk about it in a moment. Um, that we're going to ask you to partner with us to help with that mission, with that cause. And that's one of the things that we do. We have community outreach for our kids. But what are some other things we could do? 
Are there, are there other folks, there's some elderly communities in our community, is there things that we can do to help them and, and, and provide some love and, and, and comfort to them? Uh, I would love for us to look in a, in, a, in a long-term, bigger picture with other things like foster care homes and, and kids that need to find a loving home. I would love for us as a church to do more with, with those who are struggling with addiction and they would find freedom of that in life in Christ. There's so many things that we can do as a family together to reach those around us in different ways. But it's something that we have to do together. I can't do it on my own. You can't do it on your own. This is a family working together, a gathering of grace and healing and moving towards that mission. We are the church. And we are the family. We came together yesterday as a family. We celebrated the life of Fred. But you know what you did? For those of you who were able to come here in person, you know what you really did? You ministered to that family. You encouraged that family. All I did was serve some food. You served some food to some people that were hurting. All I did was move a couple chairs around. You made a way and you made an opportunity for people to sit and to talk and to laugh together. All they did was run a vacuum after it was done. Thank you so much for doing that. You prepared our, our building for the service today. I cannot do that on my own. And I very much recognize that. Any ministry, anything that we do for the people around us, we need to do it together. Maybe you lead a ministry. Maybe you're that primary person that goes out and starts this outreach or something, but you're going to get support, and you should get support from others in this church. We're going to do this together. I use the, the egg hunt, for example. Churches have been doing Easter egg hunts from the beginning of Easter, right? We really have. I think after Jesus resurrected, the next Sunday they had eggs available. I don't know how it all came together. But they've been doing it a very long time. Our, our outreach for eggs is not about giving kids candy. It's really not. We do that, right? Why do we do it? So we can share the story of Easter, which is the resurrection of Jesus. And so then we're telling the story of Jesus and how he died upon a cross and, and was and made an atonement for their sins. We share all of that. We do it by, by having them come and to get some candy and do some glow-in-the-dark Easter egg hunt, which is pretty cool. But that the purpose of that is not to give kids more cavities. It's to give kids the message of Jesus. Right? Everything that we do, every outreach that we do as a church has an underlying purpose of telling people about Jesus. We're united in that. And then we want to invite people to come and join our family. As our family grows, then we have more opportunity because we have more hands and feet to be able to do some work. We want to be a healthy church and a healthy family that grows together. So we are the church, and we are the family that makes up this church, and we do life together. Let's bow your heads this morning, and I'm going to ask you a very simple question this morning. If we do life together, are you, are you currently part of the lifeblood of this church? This is a simple question for you to, to think about yourself and think about how you can be involved in ways that you, maybe you're not involved, that you could be more involved so that you can continue to be a blessing in this church and continue to help us grow as a church because we are the family and we do life together. I also will speak to anybody here this morning who has felt an isolation, who has felt that they are, they are doing things on their own, reminding you that you are part of this church family. We are going to extend grace to you. We are going to be here for you to help you through healing because that, that helps us ultimately continue with our mission to go into this world, to preach the gospel to every creature. We do life together. And if our heads bowed, eyes closed this morning, I might be, every week I say this, and it's so important, there might be some that are watching us online or even here in person that have never accepted Christ as a Savior, never understood what he did upon that cross. You've heard the stories of Jesus. You understand resurrection. You might even believe in the stories, but you've never confessed your sins. You've never asked for forgiveness of your sins. And that is where your story really begins. That's how you join into this family of believers, by believing yourself, by calling out, Jesus, I am a sinner in need of salvation. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Change my life. Help me live my life with purpose and with meaning. 
And he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. That you ask for forgiveness of your sins. God, thank you for this time this morning. Thank you for this family that you've blessed me with and blessed us with. Thank you, God, for the hands and the feet. Thank you, God, for the, the, the emotional connection that we have with each other, that we can share in these experiences and that we can grow in our faith together. In your name, amen. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, it's great seeing everybody here this week. Just a few announcements. Tomorrow night, men's Bible study comes back, study of the end times. Hope to see all you men um, there. Um, we have next Saturday, game night. Bring your favorite game, bring your favorite snack. Any questions, see Miss Robin over there. Uh, she'll be happy to answer those for you. And as Pastor said, the extravaganza is coming. There is that, that philosophical question, which came first, the candy or the egg? Well, doesn't matter. We need to get them together. So if, if anybody can donate candy, we have a lot of empty eggs which we can fill with candy. Um, we have a lot of kids come through here, a lot of uh, opportunities to minister to them. So we ask if you can volunteer some time to do that. We would really appreciate that. Uh, there are connect cards under the seats. <clears throat> if you want us to pray for you, uh, if you want to say something to, to pastor or the church, please fill those out. Even better than that, there's the Echo app. Uh, see Miss Heather if you'd like to join that. It's a great place that we can join together as a fellowship, as a cornerstone community, to pray for each other, to minister to each other. Um, and as pastor said earlier, your generosity is important. There are the giving boxes in the back, and there is the Give app. Um, which you can give online as well. So as we leave today, Pastor said, we are the church. We are a gathering of grace. We are a gathering of healing. And we are a gathering of a mission. So as we leave today, let us be filled with the Holy Spirit and be the church. God bless and see you all next week. <laughs>